Hello, I'm David Magno, and I'm happy to be here on behalf of Open Your Eyes and Think MF and ADOC. We are in a great moment here in 2021 in terms of documentaries and in terms of Asian American documentaries. Just this year, this season, we have over 18 or 19 feature documentaries by Asian Americans, Asian Pacific Americans that were either directed or produced by us. And so we're here to document this time. And today we're so pleased as part of this, I guess, series, we have two amazing legendary filmmakers who will be in conversation with us. And that is Ramona S. Diaz, whose film this year is A Thousand Cuts and Jeff Orlowski, who this year, his film is The Social Dilemma. So please welcome Ramona S. Diaz and Jeff Orlowski. Thank you so much, David. <laughs> it's great David. to be here with you, Ramona. Yeah, it's great. David, legendary. It makes me feel old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, it's great to be here, Jeff. I mean, we were just talking, right? A year ago at uh, this time, last yeah. year, we were both at Sundance. Both our right. films premiered then. And I remember, you know, yeah. when, when for Sundance first announces and you look down the list and I saw Social Dilemma, I'm like, oh my God, that like so intersects with a thousand cuts. That's why it was like yeah. to see. So, and here we are a year later, it's been quite a, quite a ride. Uh, Absolutely, it's been a film. wild, wild year for sure. And, um, and likewise, when I saw a thousand cuts and um, saw the, the synopsis and the team and, and you at the helm, um, it was it was so awesome to see, and also the there's so many films that have been coming out about tech and different themes and different angles and different lenses on tech. Um, and I feel like we're just entering into this era where we're going to see a lot more. I think it's only going to continue to grow because there's growing, growing need for a critical lens on these companies. Yeah, and I think there, yeah, and the, and the awareness too, right, with the general public. I mean, yeah. I, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. More people have to be aware. Yeah. More people have to be really active consumers of tech mm -hmm. uh, but i think it's starting i i, I think uh, we're, we're getting to that point where even like you know once your um uh your parents start asking you about what is real what is not you right. know okay, something's <laughs> happening um uh, so it, it, it's a good time it's a you know we're, we're here with these two films that are uh, well both timely and hopefully timeless timely. is all, always right. what we're trying to do but uh, so yeah, tell me. You know, you, you always seem to like hit with uh, with your films, like climate, tech. How do you come to um, choose the stuff you want to do? Like, yeah. When I know we, uh, you know, choosing is only the first part of it because then you have to really reckon with the fact that you have you spent two years of your life, two, two three years right. of your life on it, even more. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting question, and I'm I'm excited to hear your your thoughts on this and and your response. Um, for me, I think I don't know. I feel like I'm pretty well. I, I read the news. I stay on top of things, and if something is new and revelatory to me, I feel like it's going to be revelatory to others as well. And I, that seems like super simplistic, but honestly, I think that's part of how I've been making decisions around around this. So in the case of The Social Dilemma, I had friends of mine who, and it was like this inside connection. I had friends of mine who uh, from college, from Stanford, worked in tech. And I started hearing in 2017, those friends from inside those companies saying there's a problem with the way that they made the software. And I had never, it was like, what are you talking about? Like huge light bulb. Like I've never heard this criticism before, especially not from people at Google or at Facebook or at Twitter. And, and I think the mindset for me was like, okay, this is, I haven't heard of this. Um, and what so other was, people haven't right? heard of it too. What year, how, what long, was that? how long ago was that this? Was 20, 2017 was okay. the year for me where it sort of started. So it was spring of 2017 where um, Tristan Harris, he's one of our main subjects in the film. He, um, he started speaking publicly. Um, he left Google and started criticizing Google publicly. and. I remember he posted something, I, ironically, he posted something on Facebook and I was a really heavy Facebook user. And his post on Facebook was, here, I'm, uh, I'm about to go on Anderson Cooper on 60 Minutes to talk about how Google is you know, using manipulative design techniques. 
And like all of that, it was like a friend from college was on Anderson Cooper ripping apart the tech industry. And I was, th that was the first instance of hearing it. Um, so for me, it was then trying to, you know, follow that story, find more people, learn as quickly as I could, what, you know, what are people talking about? And I remember that first year I had, you know, I had a bunch of friends that still worked at the companies and I could feel their hesitation. Like I was, I felt like I was walking on thin ice with everybody that I was talking to. And I couldn't say, oh yeah, we're coming out and criticizing tech. And that wasn't actually the goal. The goal was to like discover the truth, like what's, what's here. But I needed to talk to different people and like, so what do you think about tech addiction? What do you think about, you know, manipulative design? What's the problem with our technology? And some people I think had still been drinking the Kool-Aid in some ways and other people like were, were completely of a different mindset. And um, that was, for me, that was the, the entrance into the subject and the fascination there because um, I hadn't heard about it and, uh, and I thought others would, would resonate as well. I'm curious for you, like, how, t tell me about how you met Maria and how your, <laughs> how the project started. I mean, Maria Ressa is just such a freaking fascinating powerhouse human being. Uh, yeah. And you, you totally hit it out of the park with her as a, as a subject and protagonist. Um, how, did, how did that unfold for you? Um, it's so funny because, you know, you're talking about Facebook and how you saw this post from Tristan. My story also began with Facebook. You know, it's so weird and ironic and given the subjects of our mm -hmm. film. <laughs> but um, I was finishing Motherland, my previous film, and um, I started, uh, and then President Duterte in the Philippines, you know, ascended to power. He became president. And shortly after he became president, um, he uh, implemented the drug war. He ran on it. He said he was going to go after drug users and drug pushers, and he was going to kill him. And he did right after he became president. And so I started seeing this really horrific photographs on Facebook. And I said, something's going on, you know, so because I was born um, and raised under martial law in the Philippines. So it felt very regressive to me. I'm like, what is going on? I thought we were past this. So mm -hmm. I, that's what drew me back to the Philippines, really the drug war. But when I got there, a lot of people, a lot of filmmakers were doing that film. I'm like, let me look right. around. And I looked around and there was Maria Ressa and rapper. Um, they were talking about the drug war, but they were also, um, connecting it to the weaponization of social media and propaganda and um, mm. algorithms and disinformation. And, and she was explaining it so well and clearly just the connection right. and the networks. And like you, I was like, oh my gosh, right? I'm like, it was like this yeah. light bulb moment because, and then it, it makes the story obviously, obviously more resonant globally because it's happening everywhere. It's still very specifically a Filipino film, but a Filipino story, but it has global resonances because of exactly. this information. But it was right. very much like, I'm like, huh, I didn't think I was making that film. But mm -hmm. as documentary filmmakers, you know, we do explorations that lead us to yeah. one place, to the next place, until you reach that place where, you know, okay, this is it. You know, it's it. Like, we've done this before. Our instincts tell us this is a story you should be really pursuing right now. And you go, mm -hmm. I mean, right. it, it, you know, cause I, I do very immersive, um, very taste uh, observational stuff. It's always, I'm always sort of at the, you know, at the precipice, right? At the abyss. Mm -hmm. I don't know if my, my, I don't know where it's gonna go. It's a crazy way to make film, but to me, it's, it's exciting to make that kind of film because I always think like if right. I know how it's gonna end then I should really be doing fiction right but <laughs> now I don't know and that is the exciting part of it because you are exploring and I think something you said like but, if it, it it was exciting to you or surprising to you it should be exciting to, to an audience and that's how I feel too mm -hmm. I don't really have I'm my first audience I'm always mm -hmm. and I right. know it does sound simplistic right but it is it's like if I if I find this really surprising and amazing, someone else out there must right exactly. Yeah, um, yeah that's exactly. How, that's how it started. Oh, me. so well. First of all, the, your notion on like if you know how it's gonna end, <laughs> I feel like that's where I feel all of the anxiety in nonfiction filmmaking. It's like shoot, you, you go into it, you start exploring, and you're searching and you're following, and you're exactly as you said, you're on this precipice, and I'm just like. That, there's a stress that comes with that that is yeah. real and palpable and it lasts for years and you don't know where it's going to go. I remember, um, so with, with Chasing Coral, with, with my second feature film, um, 
there was a period we, we were trying to document how the coral reefs were changing and we were trying to do time lapses of these corals and we weren't capturing it and there's a limited window of time when the corals actually bleach it is like at the peak of summer when the temperatures hit a certain temperature then then the corals change we we almost didn't capture them and i i actually did an interview on camera with the with the notion of if we didn't capture it, this that was going to be the climax of the film. It's like it, the climax of the film might have had to be our failure to capture the coral bleaching because it just eluded us. And I had no idea how we were going to end this movie otherwise. We just spent years trying to capture it. So I don't know that there's a stress that can happen um, <laughs> that is very real and painful. Um, so I, I love that you you embrace that and, and are seeking that out because that's that's tough sometimes. Yeah, but it's a crazy way to make a film. If you tell like, uh, it is. yeah, because I'm now trying exploring fiction. If you tell that to fiction filmmakers, oh. that is a crazy way. I said it is, but it is right. also where the magic happens, right? Exactly. Because the exactly. unknown, it, if, if it pays off, it is so golden. And you know when it's yeah. paid off. Something yeah. tingles. You're like, so it's really exciting, but it's, uh, it's, a, tough, yeah. it's a tough place to be, you know, um, to, to yeah. be exploring that. And yeah. Um, uh, I'm curious. I want to. Can I throw you another some questions around sure. around your process and how you launched into this film? Um, because it's interesting. You you're from the Philippines originally, and then this story is based there. Did you did you have family there still? Did you have a support network? Did you know any crew there? Like well, you just yeah. or did you just like pick up and land and and had ha talk through those first steps of. You go to you go in some ways back to the Philippines and you're building building a team out to document this. How long were you there for for the shooting? Um, so uh, this is my fifth feature, and all my features have either been in the you know been between the Philippines and the States. So there's always mm -hmm. an element of uh, my films um, that take place in the Philippines. So I do have fixers there. They're they're most amazing fixers. Yeah. They know the landscape. They know how to navigate security, which was very important for this film. Uh, but I always, I usually bring in cinematographers and sound recordists because they're, mm. I, I like using um, people I know. Because uh, as you know, when you're, you're, it's stressful, right? Not knowing what you're shooting. Yeah. But, so I think the people who I've worked with before, who I've worked with well, we share this sort of shorthand and they know how I work because sometimes you mm. really don't have time to have that conversation every day right um so no yeah. having a base from which you know you can build I, I think a foundation from which you can build is really important uh for my process um yeah so i, I do know people there i i'm i'm still very plugged in just because i've done a lot of work there um right. like with maria actually um maria actually uh, well you know maria's very well known I, she was the face of um cnn in southeast asia for 20 years she opened the manila wow. manila bureau and then the jakarta bureau of cnn when cnn was very uh very very new in that region um so i knew of her she was you know uh, I'm, i've known of her for a long time i actually back in 04 when i premiered my very first film imelda I was flying back to the Philippines because Imelda Marcos sued us, the former first lady of the Philippines sued us in the Philippines. There was a temporary mm. restraining order in the film and I had to go back to um, actually defend it in court. So, and I was, wow. and, you know, it's one of those crazy film festival um, tours, right? That you're flying all over the place. And they said, come back to Manila, show up in court. I'm like, I really don't want to do this. But I had to, and I think I was on my way to Sydney, the Sydney Film Festival in Australia. So I did, I, I, I went to Manila first and I'm dreading it because I didn't want to be in court with Imelda Marcos. Um, and then when I land, public, the publicist said, all these you know, people in the news um, want to talk to you. You know, it's all the, the press who want to talk to you. And Maria Ressa from CNN was on the list. And I'm like, oh my God, oh. Maria wants to talk to me. Because, you know, she was like, she, I'm like, of course. And then someone tells me, well, she doesn't really like the film. So she wants to talk to you. I said, oh, I don't want to talk to her. <laughs> I didn't want to talk to her. I didn't want to litigate my film. I wanted to talk about the litigation, but not talk about my film. I was just so tired. I was... So I turned her down and people said, no, don't turn her down because you know, I'm like, no, I'm turning her down. So 14 years later, fast forward, right? I'm in her wow. headquarters, in her office, pitching a thousand cuts. And I thought, I should never remember. 14 years ago, come on, how many people has she you know, interviewed and stuff? And one of the first things out of her mouth was like, 
so I've always wondered why you turned me down all those years ago. And I'm like, oh, and it's a moment where you're like, can you pretend? Can you get out of it? And I decided, you know, I'm going to be fully honest with it. I said, you know, I just didn't want the scent. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just didn't have the energy to um, defend my film with you, you know, and I'm sorry. I said it was young. It, it was my first film. I'd never do it again, blah, blah, blah. But that's how I, the relationship with Marie <laughs> <laughs> started. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I guess uh, it worked out with you answering the question honestly like that, and it, it opened the door for for jumping in and and making this project, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it, yeah. It's it's still an odd. It was still a very odd way to 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 have a follow a journalist because they do stories, um, uh, kind of differently. I mean, she did live shots. You know, she was uh, she did two minute pieces, so she would always. I tried to explain to her that we want to be first in the room and last to be kicked out, right? Basically, that's the goal. First in the room, last one out. And uh, she would always turn to me after maybe four hours, you know, a whole day shooting. She goes, well, do you have it? I said, I'm like, have what? She goes, do you have the film? I'm like, not yet. No, I think, no, of course not. She goes, you've been here for hours. So it was this constant, like she turned to me, do you have it? Like trying to understand what it was. And I can't even explain what it is until you know it, right? It's like yeah. you laugh and you sort of think, but you there's, know, you, have a coral, you know, you you're have you're onto something here. Like I think a lot of different subjects. So film subjects aren't used to the scale and scope required to make nonfiction, right? And when you have film subjects who are very, very press savvy or are journalists or have done a lot of press, they're they're used to cameras in a particular way and any deviation from that seems like a, a, a huge shift and a huge lift and and I, I mean there can be a lot of anxiety like you're going to film me you're going to follow me for how many years like how long like what you want access to me in my hotel room and bedroom and in my like brushing my teeth in the bath like there's a there's a huge amount of trust right that that has to be extended with film subjects um I know that um in the case of the social dilemma we were really actively trying to follow Tristan around as much as possible. And it became a burden and a sore. I'm, I'm sure he got tired of me like pestering him. And I, I typically, um, um, my, my background is in cinematography. So I'm very, very comfortable with the cameras and I know how to run sound here. And so there are plenty of times where I, I do things sort of by myself and I'll just run a wireless mic and run it directly into the camera and, and kind of operate solo following somebody around. I think that has its pros and its cons I'm realizing too, because sometimes I think subjects are like, oh, it's just you. Like the, it, it seems smaller in scope. Sometimes it gives you more access, but sometimes it makes it feel like less formal or official or less proper because um, there isn't like a crew. So I don't know, there are definite um, pros and cons to that strategy. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I, I think it's worked out overall so far, but. <laughs> I think when they're less, they, they think it's less formal and so they're less on. So it works, you know, right. it's like, this is like the smaller part of the, whatever that smaller part is. But I was also very ready. Like there was always, I had uh, two units on the ground making this film, but I, there was always a smaller DSLR for me to pick up. That was always oh. set to go just in case it was places that no one else could be in, right? Or it was just, right. would say, just you. But she never said that. I mean, to be really fair, the minute she said yes uh, before signing anything, because I don't typically ask people to sign anything, it's really their word, because I feel like th mm. that paper will always get in the way. And, you know, what are you, what are you going to do, Jeff? I mean, you're not going to force people to give you that access right. and if they sign a piece of paper you're going to sue them that's never going to happen i mean right. how crazy is that so i don't think right. that the paper in the end works um which um you're i know it goes against sorry, everything like, people say but right trust but but you're talking about just a regular release because i mean i'm from my the lawyers want to release for us to sell the movie <laughs> or something so no, you sell the movie yeah at the end right yeah. when you're selling the film okay. yes everyone of course she signed a whole like Okay. Major deal memo because she signed for Rappler for all the journeys for herself for right, archive. Right, right. But I think in that initial when you ask them, right, and then yeah. it's very, to me it's a big turn off to say, well, can you sign? Because I'm with you that, that piece completely. of paper is never gonna hold. I mean, if they don't want to be filmed, they don't want to be filmed, right? You can't ever exactly. force them, and it's 
when you say, you know, you really want to follow them and it's a toothbrush, like a brushing your teeth moment, you know, you've turned a corner when you can film them brushing, yeah. or sleeping in the car. We say, can, did we get the sleeping in the car moment? But um, right. I never tell them really, that it's a slow reveal what I really want. Mm -hmm. because I think if they knew all at once what it was, like we follow them for years, they would never right. do it. I mean, I wouldn't. And right. I wouldn't say yes right. to it. So, right, yeah. right. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And it is, yeah, it is um, trust that's grown over time. And I'm, I'm with you. I don't think we, if somebody's doing a sit down interview and we're just going to talk to them for, yeah. you know, an hour or two, then we do the release and, um, you know, ha sometimes have them sign the release before they we start the interview and then go into it. Um, but typically, I I'm with you. I think for those long relationships, the trust is so important and the release can get in the way and can feel... It, the goal is not to make it feel like a contract, right? It is not a contractual thing. This is a, you know, creative alignment and following somebody for a long time, which is a, a huge imposition on their life. Mm -hmm. And they need to, I don't know, I, I felt like we, um, I try to share with subjects just how difficult it's going to be, right? It's going to take a long time. And, and I don't know, we've been, we've been working with subjects who are working on issues that they feel the urgency of the issue, whether it's climate change or technology. It's like, hey guys, we need the movie last year. Like there, there's so much pressure from the subjects around when, you, when is it gonna be done? Like even, it's not done yet. Like, it's like, no, these things take time. Oh, Give us some time, trust us. And it's, it's really, really hard to, to build that trust sometimes. Um, but uh, I think w once you find that alignment and and uh, they see they see you're in in it for the long run, um, there's that extension of trust as well. Yeah, and I and I just wanted to yeah clarify yeah if it's interviews and one offs you know you do that release right mm -hmm. after but if it is a long relationship, and there are ways too you know they're very aware that you know. Um, I always say, okay, so are you ready to film? And I'm being recorded. So that also can stand up. There, there is a expectation that we're there. They see the camera, uh, everyone's right. cool with it. So there, um, also there are ways to make sure that you get it on cam, but yeah. never, yeah. yeah uh, the, uh, people listening to this will be like, what, we've been told to get <laughs> Yeah, but it, it is about trust at the end because yeah. you, one can make people do anything something they don't want to do and uh it's right. it isn't ever going to happen so you you have to build a trust with people yeah yeah you made a comment about um when when people need to feel on like when when and i think that's something as you know as, as documentary filmmakers i think we're always watching our subjects and seeing them and seeing when they're actually themselves versus when they're projecting or performing for the camera or they're aware that the cameras are rolling and they put on a persona. Like, I feel like that, that always happens. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why I love using wireless lavs because with the wireless mic, they forget that the microphone is there. I, I love like first thing, put the microphone on and step back and you know, you're seeing them say hello, whatever. And then they're wired and then they can go and do whatever. And I don't know, for, for a lot of nonfiction, I feel like a boom pole is a really intimidating thing right uh, having a boom hang over you you're like always aware like oh i'm being documented right now um but uh but a long lens you can stand back and have a long lens and a wireless mic and be in there and be intimate and and the subject doesn't feel like you're that close to them so that's yeah. the uh yeah i i definitely prefer that type of operation just to give them that freedom and flexibility and not not having them feel like they have to perform yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We always start with uh, a long lens, you know, not being in their mm -hmm. space, you know. So we mm -hmm. gradually come into their space, but I think mm -hmm. those first few days, even the first week of filming, it's always long lens. So we're always away and until they get. Mm -hmm. I mean, they see us there, so they're aware, and then we slowly move into their space. But it's not mm -hmm. immediate in your space, you know. That right. uh, uh, yeah. So. Um, yeah, and the, the lab, so, you know, that's also the very first thing we do. We, we mic people up and then you can go. And sometimes yeah. they forget and sometimes they don't. Uh, you, you know when they forget, you know uh, they've forgotten when they go to the 
bathroom, right? And then they yeah. both turn it off. You know, oh my God, they forgot. And then you turn it, we, we stop recording because right. that's also not, right. you know, after right, exactly. them in the bathroom. But you know then, oh my God, they really forgot, right? But if yeah. they still turn it off in the bathroom, I'm like, oh, they're still aware. They're still aware. Yeah. But it always comes mm-hmm. some time and they forget. And you're like, that's okay. That's funny. That's very yeah. true. Um, tell me, about, I'm curious from a, scheduling perspective um because okay you you pick maria as a subject and you're working with her i mean do you you were just referencing you know the first few days or first week of filming do you typically do like a big chunk together and then like how do you gap out a big phase of production then time off then more production because there's just an infinite number of ways to 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 proceed like that You know, um, I like having what I call containers in my films. So Mm -hmm. like um, a year, like when I filmed teachers recruited from the Philippines to teach in inner city Baltimore for the learning, for example, I wanted their freshman year here, right? So it's a container Mm -hmm. and seasons. I like containers because the truth of the matter is I hate not knowing when I'm going to end. I hate those shoots. It's like, oh my God. And with Maria just cases so it couldn't depend on the case right she has like 10 mm-hmm. court cases i wasn't about to it's not about following all those court cases We're, we can be talking about five years 10 years you know it's just impossible to go after legal cases so i knew then i think at some point during prep in 2018 the midterm elections were coming up the year after in 2019 so i knew that was my container uh, it was against the backdrop of midterm elections, but I knew very clearly in my head it wasn't going to be a campaign film. But that was the mm. backdrop, and and I knew it was going to be kinetic and cinematic because and s- full of spectacle because that's what elections are in the Philippines. They're full of right, right. But what I didn't know, and and this is pure you know luck, not luck, but I guess serendipity, was that the day after campaigning began. Maria gets her first arrest warrant, right? She's arrested. I mean, the mm-hmm. day after campaigning began and then five weeks later, she gets arrested again and then she gets time 100. And then so in the course of, I chose a container. I thought, okay, Maria is just going to be fighting her fight over that. But I didn't think it would be so dramatic. And by then, mm. we had full access, right? So right. I, I tried to stay away from breaking news of the drug war, but then Maria became breaking news. I'm like, oh my God, I'll do it. Right. I, I, I don't know how to handle breaking news. I don't have the capacity to fight the press. But by then she had given us full access. So we were then, we were the uh-huh. ones who were jumping in the car with her after being arrested, for example. So now we yeah. had to pull back, right? Show the press covering her. The press covering the press really was what it was in the case of Maria. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. so, you know, when these things happen that I, I couldn't have written it that way. I mean, that's like, right? <laughs> right, and of course. It's really like a courting disappointment <laughs> if you, if you um, say the next day, Maria will get, get into more trouble. Um, right. and then, but it happened. And then you're like, okay, we're, got, we're going. And then the end of May was elections happened and we wrapped. And then we still followed her sort of traveling some but we started post already and then mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and then we had what half a year before well we had less than that for Sundance because we didn't really expect to be right. at Sundance but you know <laughs> so lucky that they they took us last year yeah yeah that's I, I love your notion of a container um I haven't operated that way now you've got me thinking like oh that's a good way to because I I, I <laughs> think we've been falling How into do you- the we've been falling into the uh, never ending timeline. Like there's no end date and like what, so, you know, in Tristan's case, it was looking for like, where is his story gonna come to some sort of conclusion? Like what's the climax of Tristan's story and trying to document that. And then also recognizing, well, here he's basically become an activist who's on this never ending quest. There is no conclusion. There is no climax in some ways. Um, he ended up doing a Senate hearing, and that was that was a big moment in his life and for the film. And, and so uh, we were able to document that and sort of built that into the climax of his story arc. Um, but part of it, um, with with the uniqueness of the social dilemma and and sort of this narrative through line that we built into the film, we sort of used the climax of the narrative as the climax of the film and built around the ideas 
of the existential threat being the climax of the film. But that that was something that it took a really long time to for us to figure out how are we going to end this movie with this potential for this never ending, you know, right. traveling around the world and doing speaking engagements that Tristan was doing. Um, but when, so when I, I did the that, narrative um, thread, when did you think that that was going to be an element in social yeah. dilemma? Yeah, interesting. So um, for the first year, as I said, we started like in 2017, conceptually, 28, the, the end of 2017 is when I was talking with Tristan regularly and seeing if he would agree and, and, and wanting him to be clear, like, this is going to be a big commitment, right? And like, I only want you to do this if you're aware of like the level of commitment this is going to be. Um, and so in January of 2018, that's when we first started filming. And he, he just founded his nonprofit, the Center for Humane Technology, and he started doing a bunch of press and he was doing like a little press junket in New York. So that's one of the first things that we started filming with him and started filming him, you know, he went to DC and he went to lobby in Congress and he, he was doing events like that. Um, and in, uh, I guess it was probably April of 2018, April, May, something like that. We did an extended like two weeks of sit down interviews with a whole bunch of different people that we met through Tristan, through his um, organization and others that we had known through the tech industry and, and did a, like a bulk of our interviews. And, and at that point it was like, okay, this movie could be all talking heads. Like this easily could be a wall to wall intellectual talking head film. And we were searching for Tristan's like cinema verite to be a, another backbone. And how do we, how do we interweave the talking heads in the cinema verite? And that was kind of the original framing and thinking. Um, it was in that process that we kept learning about the algorithms and kept learning about like what algorithm, like what is an algorithm? What is it doing? How is it controlled? Like, and, and that was just such a concept that I was not familiar with and was constantly learning. I mean, for me, I love looking back at the original interviews and the original transcripts and, and I can see like, oh, I asked that question. Like, that seems so basic to me now, but I remember that question was a genuine, I didn't understand that thing at the time. I think yeah. that's that's what I love about nonfiction filmmaking so much is like we we get to be students like we get to be full time professional students with access to whoever you can get access to and like great I'm gonna ask the, these engineers how the software works it just seemed like such a special thing um, I still go back to them it's like there are times where I, somebody asks me a question I don't know and I text somebody I'm like how does this work like and to have that like direct access to somebody is kind of cool but um. It was, it was somewhere in that process where we saw it could be all talking heads. We wanted to challenge ourselves creatively. We wanted to make it more accessible to the audience. And we were learning about how the algorithms worked. And we started joking around like, you know, there's Inside Out, um, the Pixar film. There's the, uh, the Woody Allen film, uh, Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex But We're Too Afraid to Ask. Um, there are a handful of different films that sort of go into the human body and they anthropomorphize emotions in the body or like there's a control center. And that just create, we, we were sort of joking about that one day around, um, I remember the joke was around Will Ferrell. Like imagine Will Ferrell was standing there at a control center and controlling what you saw on your phone. And that's, that's where it started. And we just kind of kept riffing on that idea. And um, we were learning about the way the algorithms work and resurrections and different things. And, um, so it's that whole concept of this fictional narrative came out of how do we bring the algorithms to life and, and could we do something like that? And, uh, and then I remember I was sitting on a plane one day, um, flying to meet up with Tristan and, uh, and his team. And I was just journaling, I was writing my journal and I, I remembered like the idea just crystallized as opposed to like a little scene or a little vignette we can actually have an entire story that is showing all these different things that we've learned about the algorithms and we can show how it's affecting people at the same time and see both sides of that. And I was super excited about it, but then I was like nervous to tell my producer and my creative team, like, oh, hold on, this is a completely different curveball idea and I don't know if it's gonna work or not. Um, it was, uh, and so we went, we went down that path. It was, it was a huge, creative challenge with um, our writer and editor. We spent so much time mocking everything up. We, we wrote an independent script, so a 40 page script for the narrative stuff, which worked as a standalone script, but then we had to interweave it with the documentary. I felt like we were making three movies. Like we were making the documentary 
we were making the AI story and then we were making the human story and we had to get the scenes to transition. And um, we, we storyboarded the whole movie and edited it into the documentary. So uh, that was a big phase. Um, yeah, that's a, a long winded, it's, it's weird. It's, it wow. feels like I'm just reliving trauma right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know exactly what you mean, but when you said like you had to go back then to the, your producers and the stakeholders, it's always this moment where, hey guys, good news, but good news, bad news, right? It's always right, like exactly. good news, have a great idea, but bad, it's not exactly the film that I mm -hmm. told you about, right? But right. I, I, you know, I've been at, at those like instances, it's like, hey, great news, but uh, so, um, and I, I'm so happy. I think that's we have supporters who will say, okay, go do that, yeah, right? Yeah. Because you don't know. I was, I was just gonna say, like, I think that's one of the blessings of the independent route and having supporters that believe in you and believe in your work and your, your approach. Um, I know, I, I just feel like a lot of studios wouldn't necessarily support that creativity or that exploration where, wait a second, you sold us on this idea. That was the budget. That's what we greenlit. And you have to stick to that. Um, but uh, I think that's something that's so beautiful about the Sundance community, about the independent community, about like the notion of following the story where it needs to go, which I think is for nonfiction films and for feature, for, you know, nonfiction feature films in particular, I think that's where the most beautiful work can come from. Like it is the open-ended exploration and it's the following, you know, following the muses and, and the inspiration yeah. where it leads you. And, and you don't know where, you know, where a story might take you. And I, from my experience, that's some of the most magical and some of the best stuff. If you have the time and resources and team yeah. and support to allow you to do that, which I recognize is not always the case, but that's, it, yeah. it's a, it's a beautiful balance if you can find it. Yeah, I, I think the um, the producers and the funders, the stakeholders will follow you uh, for as long as you stick to the original themes, right? Like my yeah. theme was not necessarily press freedom, right? It wasn't. It was about uh, power and impunity and, um, mm -hmm. and the rise of authoritarianism. So it wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. the erosion of of press freedom that wasn't even in the equation mm -hmm. but it was about life under Duterte so I think if the mm -hmm. themes remain the same they will they will right. take a chance with you right something has right. to remain the same right I mean and, and the bigger themes but in terms right. of narrative and how you then tackle those themes it can it changes because you find characters that you didn't know existed before I mean Maria was nowhere in my first right. pitch I mean she she was nowhere. Ah, I mean, I did not pitch her. Um, and then I discovered her and I'm like, oh my God. And then she was included in it, but she was only part of a mm -hmm. bigger, what I call uh, ensemble cast. Because the way I was pitching this uh, A Thousand Cuts in the beginning was very Robert Altman-esque, right? Very ensemble. Mm. Um, and I, I referenced shortcuts. I don't know if you know shortcuts. Robert Altman, there was like a, this... Um, uh, uh, there was insecticide was being um, uh, sprayed onto LA because there was this fruit fly uh, 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 crazy problem during this summer. And so in my head, Duterte was a fruit fly and, you know, Manila for LA. That was in my head. Of course, it doesn't turn out that way That's because amazing. life happens. And, <laughs> and then the, I always say the center of gravity shifts, right? And then it, it, it mm -hmm. sort of, you know, then the major participant of the film, your major subject really emerges and you can't turn away. When you can't turn away, you're like, okay, this is this is it. You got to right, right. her story. Yeah. But you're right, as, as long as you're on that theme and it's, um, if you can share with the team, uh, this, is the, this is a better representation of these ideas or this is the best representation of these ideas. Um, I remember with, with uh, Chasing Coral, with our previous film, we went in following one subject who was kind of the protagonist. And over the course of the film, it sort of revealed itself that there was somebody else on our team that we've been following, um, Zach Rago, who in some ways his story becomes the main story and the, and the backbone that his personal care and compassion and empathy and love for the corals was, was a thing that we wanted to pivot to. And yeah. so like, I remember calling up my producer and saying like, I, think that 
Zach's going to end up being like the main central emotional figure. And, and it was just like a huge curveball uh, for everybody. But, um, but, you know, I think you have to trust your instincts and trust your gut on those things. Um, and, and like, I, like we said, you know, if there's the time and ability and support to explore those things and find, you know, where those thread lead, threads lead, I, that's the magic and the challenge of nonfiction filmmaking in my mind and, and the the way that we tell feature stories um uh part of me wishes that i had a story that you know here's a story from 15 years ago where you know the ending and like you can do a you know a historical re, re, you know retrospective where you know the climax before you go into it but this is um you know this field of filmmaking i think is some of the most organic and raw um yeah. I, I i kept thinking about andy timiner's we live in public i don't yeah. know if you're familiar with that but it's a you know she she documented these people for like a decade going through countless different forms of technology over that course of time and to think of a decade-long documentation like that it it shows itself in the filmmaking and the power of that that storytelling and uh, I don't know, it gives, it gives me a little bit more hope, not that I'm trying to do a decade long project, but just to know like there, there are ways out if you need more time, you can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a figuring out. It's also the pivoting, that's scary, right? It's a scary thing to do, but uh, 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 when it becomes really obvious that you have to do it, you just have to jump in. Like my previous film, Motherland, was not at all about a, uh, the busiest maternity hospital in the world. I mean, reproductive health and reproductive justice were the themes, but it looked completely different from my initial pitch. But when I found the place, I found the form, I said, guys, this is it. This is the film. Trust me. And, you know, it's always like, trust me, this is the film. And yeah, I, and I, yes, recognizing that that support is not always there, right? So it's lucky. Mm -hmm. But I think that the field is coming to realize stakeholders coming to realize that that is the way to work right to trust the filmmaker to uh, that right. things will change because it's an ever mm -hmm. it's life happening in front of the lens things will right. take a turn and um right. and i think all filmmakers filmmakers should be supported in right. that honor it really exactly. it, we we you come up with richer more innovative films i think absolutely um, I, I think we have to wrap soon, but I wanted to ask you a question um, to kind of tie these together. Um, you know, we were talking about climaxes of films a little while ago, but then there's the resolution and the denouement, like the way you end and wrap up the bow at the end of a film. I, I wanted to ask you, what, what was your thinking with A Thousand Cuts and, and with your filmmaking around, like, what's that tone, that emotion that you want to leave an audience with at the very, very end, you know, before they get up and leave their seats and they're going to go, you know, back to their daily lives? How, how do you think about that with your filmmaking? So uh, that's a great question. I always, um, I always try to um, mimic my the major characters. Um, in this case, in a thousand cuts, Maria's optimism. I couldn't end on a down note because she's so optimistic, and I wanted to reflect right. that in the end. So um, when we uh, when we got into Sundance, we did. I did not have an end. I, I'm like, what is the end of this film? So I, I actually flew back to Manila like a month before to, to get the ending. Um, and it was the holidays. So I said, let's film a Christmas holiday or right, celebrating the year, wrapping it up that way. So, um, so I thought of it as a positive thing, right? Celebrating the year. And Maria's always positive at those parties. Like it's always about love and caring because that's Maria and I wanted to end on that note. So at the Sundance premiere, that was the end. But then life happens, right? Mid-year, in a pandemic year, she gets a verdict and she's found guilty in June, June 15th. So we couldn't ignore that. So right before we went on the virtual cinema, we, we had to add on um, the, her getting arrested and getting, um, getting a verdict of up to six years for cyber libel. So that's how it ends now. But the two things, but she's still very positive because she goes, you know, you must, um, you must defend your rights or you must use your rights or you will lose them, right? It's still a very, mm. it, in a way, positive, but it completely changed the mm. end. And now you see everyone in masks right. because it's the middle of the pandemic. It, like from six right. months, from end of 2019 to mid 2020, everyone is mass and it puts you right in the middle of like pandemic here, right in the middle of COVID. 
Um, but we felt like we couldn't ignore it. You know, we, we, we had to put it realizing that it's going to be, it's really going to change it in a way, right? It's not the up mm -hmm. hopeful, still hopeful because Maria's hopeful, right? She's still always mm -hmm. fighting, even if she just got, right. you know, she just got a sentence of up to six years in prison. She was still very articulate and very clear on that she had to keep fighting. And right. that in itself is right. positive. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How did you? Oh, yeah, similar. Oh, oh, but the narrative ends yours, right? The na narrative ends. Yeah, yours. we kind of, I, I think, in a similar way, um, you know, we're talking about these big themes and these big issues, and you don't want to leave an audience on a depressed note. You don't want to leave them in a, like, okay, great, I'm going to go, like, now, now what? I mean, I think there's a, there's a tension that we always have to, to balance there, but uh, you know, I think for our whole team, we were looking for that optimism and that that positivity as well. You know, we we sort of close with the note that um, we can change this technology. This is this is technology that was made by people and can be changed by people. It's just code, and and leaving people with that somewhat uplifting and hopeful sense that um, we can rebuild this if we choose to, and we can make this technology better for all of us if we choose to. And that both means, you know, putting pressure on the companies and we need legislation and, and all of this. Um, and uh, we did try to use the end credits. I, I'm a fan of using end credits as like the body of the film still because it, it is this, people can stick around for the credits if you do have that content continuing. So we use that as like all the tips and suggestions that, uh, that our experts gave us over the course of making the film and tried to tie it all together with that. Um, and encourage people to, uh, you know, to to be more aware of their technology in that process. But um, this has been such an awesome conversation, Ramona. Know, I'm so thrilled great, so you get to, to dive yeah. in with you. And yeah. uh, so thankful to ADOC for, for hosting this and supporting um, all of the amazing Asian American filmmakers and uh, Pacific Islander filmmakers that are out there this year and uh, yeah. making a difference and in, in getting seen with their work. So this has been a, a thrilling, thrilling time with you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's certainly a watershed year for Asian American filmmakers. I feel the shift, you know, coming. Um, I hope it's real. You know, I think it's real. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it's just been a this great conversation. I love having conversations yeah. with other filmmakers and talk about process. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, it's really you know enjoyable and absolutely and it's just fun. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Thanks so much, Ramona.